and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Welcome everyone to Irreverent Faith and Current Affairs. We are Church of England vicars, but with a slight difference insofar as we, uh, you know, I don't know. What is our difference? I don't know. People just have to just judge yourself. We haven't been sacked yet. We haven't been sacked. Yes, that's true. That's, that, is, that is different to an alternative reality in which we might have been sacked. Uh, the voice you just heard is, of course, Daniel French, and I'm Jamie Franklin. Daniel French, um, so how, how are things with you, Daniel? I know we shouldn't talk about the weather, but it has been glorious this week. Oh, yeah, it's been um, really nice here, really nice. uh, I've started in the last couple of weeks doing cold water swimming. Oh, lovely. How's that been? Rather reviving. I I think when you get into your mid-50s, a bit of energy slumps. I'm tender prone to... (laughs) So do you do 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 that in the morning, Daniel? Yeah, I've been doing it pretty much nearly every morning. So first thing, you go down to the sea? Go go, go down to the sea. I've got this beautiful... um, beach which is like a massive swimming pool it's got a really nice depth to it lovely um first 10 minutes are abrasing where i think what the heck am i doing or words to that effect that are mostly unrepeatable um and then uh, (laughs) and then you just get this this wonderful kind of buzz yeah and you think i don't want to leave i'm just sort of like floating here in uh in this pool of um, nippy water well, yeah. it's not too nippy it's about 15 degrees but it yeah it takes your body a while and then you just think this is amazing you know this incredible view i'm feeling very refreshed and then um yeah i've been so i've been quite buzzed up on the back of yeah that. Um, amazing well let me let yeah. me ask you this daniel because we, we really should get on because we've got loads of stuff to talk about today but do you the thing about that i've got river near me and it sounds very appealing but the thing i'd be worried about is parishioners or people who know who i am would come by see me in the you know, my shorts and think, what on earth is the vicar doing? Has he gone mad? Have you had, have you had any of that? There's a lot of people doing it around here. But on right. Saturday, there was a big cancer research fundraiser where uh, I didn't know this, but there was about 60 people came in around about the same time I did. So loads of people are doing it. There's a beach cafe right next door where my friends uh, employ my kids. So it's it's just, it's very normative, but I know what you mean. Mm. Um if uh, if this was a less commonly known beach, would folk, would folks think, oh, why is the vicar? <laughs> why is the vicar? <laughs> is it all got a bit much? Um, so no, it's 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 it's, it's grand. Um, awesome. uh, and you get people paddle boarding and surfing and whatever. Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's more normal, isn't it? If I just do it's in the river, normal, there's yeah. there's no one in the river, so people think, yeah. oh, what's this guy doing in the river? Anyway, you could John the I could see it as very John the Baptist like, you know, uh, call, yeah, maybe. calling passers by to uh, come on down, come on down. The water is fine, mm. Daniel. Let's do it. Let's move on. Um, so a couple of uh, things. So thank you very much to everyone who's bought this coffee. I often read these um res- these messages out when people buy us the virtual coffee online. They leave nice messages, so I just wanted to read some of them. Alan Mo says, "Listen to you every week and enjoy the prayer and banter in the film The Sin Eater." A protagonist says, knowledge is the enemy of faith. Is this true? Uh, the answer is uh, no, um, but we don't have time to elaborate. Uh, but there's a, there's a, there's a, well, Christianity is the oldest intellectual tradition in the Western world. It's not true that faith is opposed to reason. Uh, someone else said, keep going. Nick said, thank you for providing this conversational podcast series where Christian Orthodox, in brackets, mostly views, what does he mean mostly, can be expressed and explored, helping prepare the rest of us to think through our responses <laughs> in the arguments that we will all probably encounter in the week ahead. Thank you very much. It's all right if you think we're mostly... It's, it's probably um, Tom. They're probably yeah, talking about Tom. Yeah. They're probably talking about his heresy. Uh, uh, and Ant bought us 10 coffees. I mean, this gets better. This 10 been, coffees? Fantastic. Well, no, you just wait. Uh, hi, guys. Long time listener. You read my email of the week out many episodes ago about working in Asda mid-COVID. My, in my opinion, the pod has got even better since then. Maybe it was my input. Who knows? Humbly joking. Since I started tithing properly and with a right heart, the Lord has blessed me monthly by simply providing for me. And this month I got a tax rebate. So I thought, what better way to stick it to the man by getting my tax back than giving some of it away to my favorite anti-establishment podcast. God bless you all. Keep spreading the truth. Keep watching. To quote Tom, I don't remember. It's just a reference to Tom uh, not remembering the sign off for the end of the show. Rob bought us 40 coffees. Gents, we've been great. How many? 40, four zero, which is amazing. Four zero. Wow. Yeah. That's a great. big number in the Bible. 
It is. It's symbolic. We've been greatly mm. blessed by your podcast. So it's high time we brought you our tithe into our storehouse in your direction. God bless you for sharing true conviction. Courage That's and marvelous. For, for providing edifying discussion, both spiritually and intellectually. Your work is not in vain. Uh, listen to this one. Samuel brought you 10 coffees. Dear Jamie, Tom and Daniel, thank you ever so much. I cannot easily put into words how grateful I am for your ministry through this podcast. I had a great sense of relief when I discovered a reverend from your debate on Premier Unbelievable John Stevens. I had felt so desperately alone and ostracised and couldn't believe that not more Christians were opposed to everything Rona related. Since then, I've been listening to new episodes as they have been released. And in between all the other episodes from the start, almost every day on my commute to and from work. Um... Side note, great theme tunes, by the way. My cycling pace really picked up when they played between episodes with their catchiness and high tempo. Now I'm driving, but I still do a bit of head banging. Uh, I still, I'm still working my way through the episodes. I'm up to 25th of February, 2022. It's a while ago. This is slightly obsessive, maybe, but I found it incredibly cathartic and healing in processing the traumas inflicted on us over the last few years and the fear that they will return. Although there is still plenty of anger and hurt in me, your past and future prayers appreciated. I found comfort in the fact that you and many others out there have a similar mind, the community and down-to-earth nature of those I met at the live event in February, and the repeated reminder that the good news of Jesus is our hope. These words still don't capture my gratitude fully, so simply thank you, as says Samuel. And there are some, there are others as well. That, that's amazing, that. isn't it? I mean, we, we were, we've talked about in um, our uncolored bit about our book writing, and yeah, I, I was minded that in in the book project I've got. And I suspect this also touches upon the book that you're working on. We're both realizing that going back to that number 40, mm. all of this takes time. Yes. And that that there is a sort of deprogramming mm. that Christianity offers from worldliness. And and so, you know, hearing someone saying, Well, look, I've gone back to episodes and I'm I'm listening, I'm I'm working my way through those. Um, there's a, there's a lot of churches out there, you know, they're very glitzy that want to offer everything at the push of a button, an instant, instant Christ, you know, instant, instant religious experience. And I think what we're trying to do is say, no, we've got to gradually acclimatize ourselves to yeah. to the gospel, and that takes a, a, an investment. And um, you know, that's why we've been doing this week after week. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Offering offering this time of reflection because there is there is a sort of unfurling, yes. Um, because the you know what's out there is 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 very pernicious and powerful and can get its tentacles into us, into deep down in the soul. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, totally agree, Daniel. Speaking That's of very which, humbling, isn't it? Very right, humbling. It's amazing. It's very amazing. Humbling. It's amazing, and it's just it's just incredible to to think you know if we're helping people in any way, it's just well, it's, you know it's. it's mm. The Lord's grace, isn't it? Um, But we should um, go to scripture now because um, it's a big week because clearly we'll be talking about what's been going on in in the Middle East and in Israel and the the situation with Hamas. So we need God's guidance. So I'll pray uh, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Daniel, you can say a prayer at the end if you don't mind. Um, And then we'll do our Bible reading, which today is taken from uh, Luke chapter 21. So let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, Could so you just check, you said chapter... Yeah, we're on chapter 21. Uh, okay. and we're, we're beginning... the notes you sent me said chapter 11. Right? Yeah, it was a typo. It has been corrected, but um, it's one of uh, one of my many administrative errors in life. <laughs> uh, chapter 21, beginning at verse 25 of the gospel, according to Luke. This is Christ speaking about the coming of the Son of Man. Christ says, and there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. I'm just going down to verse 34 now. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, 
praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So, Daniel, just to, the reason I chose this is because it, uh, it, what's been going on reminded me of a sermon I preached in Advent. I can't remember which year it was, but I went and found the the notes and I'm not going to rehearse the whole sermon now. Um, but clearly this gospel passage is talking about cosmic signs, which could be to do with you know extreme weather events or something like that. In the Gospel of Matthew, it appears that Christ is talking about the same thing when he uses the the um the famous phrase wars and rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquake in various places and and so on and so forth. But these this seems to be talking about events, sort of cataclysmic events that will come upon the world before the coming of the Son of Man. And there's a sort of ambiguity about about when the Son of Man will will you know will actually arrive. There won't be any sort of um there won't be any sense that people are unclear about when Jesus has returned. He will return and it will be clear to everyone and it will be preceded by this sort of period of uncertainty and unrest. Um, so I just had sort of three things to say and very, very briefly, uh, just in terms of, you know, what we do in the meantime, you know, when we see things happening, we don't know whether the son of man is, is imminently to return or whether he's to return in the future. Um, it's quite clear. I'm, I don't, I'm sure you'd agree, Daniel, it's quite clear in scripture through what Christ says and through what the new Testament says that we don't have the ability to to accurately predict when precisely it will happen, but we're told there are certain things that we should do in the meantime. So just three things from this passage. The first thing is watch at all times. This is what Christ says to us. So it's not good enough just to go with what you know the BBC or what the Guardian says. We have to have godly discernment, which is based on prayerful understanding of scripture. Are you saying the BBC and the Guardian don't have, <laughs> don't have godly discernment? My goodness. No, well, no, well, that's up Jamie to that's Franklin. Up to, that's up to uh, that's up to listeners to to discern, isn't it? Who do we trust? That's that's a really important, a really important question. You know, don't allow the BBC or the Guardian access to your mind without thinking about who you're letting in there. You know, we need to think about these things. You know, what you what you give your attention to is what you become. So if you've got the BBC app on your phone and you're allowing it to send you alerts, that's going to have an influence on the way you see the world. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, is that a godly influence or not? I mean, I'm convinced that the BBC is very far from being a godly influence for all sorts of reasons, but um, not least because they promote literally promote Satanism. But it's up to it's up to people to discern these things. That's the point. So watch, you know, watch at all times what Christ says. Be wakeful to to what you're allowing into your mind. Um, secondly, take heed to yourselves. This is something else Christ says. So it's, that's about watching yourself, you know, watching out there, watching inside as well. So the Very fear, important. yeah. So we see here a psychological link between fear and sin. You know, fear leads to despair, which leads us into sin. And I think this is probably why Christ mentions these things. You know, dissipation, drunkenness, the cares of this life. You know, these aren't necessarily terrible things, sins, but they're things which sort of cloud our ability to mm -hmm. see clearly. So it's a spiritual. They're they're, they're either extremes, aren't they? I, mean, I see yes. sort of in. Um, uh, Talking on verse 34, is it? Yeah, 35, 34. Yeah. Um, that, that you've got drunkenness on one. You know, in other words, just lose your lose yeah. your mind. Yeah. And then anxiety. Yeah. Which is the other end uh, of it, to sort of just be crumpled up by the um by the events of the world and everything around, to be overwhelmed and just yeah. to sort of shrink away. Uh, yeah, and to care I, I, too, to care too much, almost uh, in comparison to not caring at all, because you're out of your head. Yeah, and and there's a there's a, a link, isn't there? Because if we if we feel anxious and we allow allow mm. fear to overwhelm us, then it's very easy to indulge in sin as a way of coping with it, as a way of either you know, um, obliviating yourself to to coin uh, a phrase used in Harry Potter to 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 take yourself into a place of oblivion where you don't have to think about it. Or by dealing with the the sense of discomfort and pain and depression, it 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 it, it brings to you by by indulging in the the fleeting pleasure of of sin and, and indulgence in that way. Mm. Which so, is interesting, isn't it? When you think about that, our forebears were perhaps much more balanced about this in the face of all the all the troubles, adversities, and much shorter life that they had, and yet, you know, 
it doesn't take a genius to see, let alone a sociologist, <laughs> that um, they had a much better mental health than than we seem to be having at the moment. You know, and you can see that in poorer parts of the world that um, people are smiling a lot more. <laughs> mm. yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's because we use uh, technology and um, ostensible societal advance to try and supply us with a meaning to our lives, and it can't. It was interesting actually. I was reading. Um, I'm reading Danny Kruger's book at the moment, Covenant, and he makes this really interesting point that the the concept of sort of state sanctioned euthanasia was pretty much unheard of until you get to modernity. But it's in modernity that we have the highest quality of life, you know, um, relatively speaking, in physical terms. So we can you know, we can medicate ourselves when we're dying, for example, we can use pain relief, so that dying is actually a far less painful process than it's ever been in history. And yet, and we have the most comfortable surroundings. And yet, this is the moment when we've decided to make to push euthanasia and to say, well, actually, you know, we, we when people are dying, they should be given the option to kill themselves, and there should be state sanctioned suicide. But that was never thought about when, when no. society was a lot less comfortable than it is now. And it's, it's, I mean, it's clearly because we, we we just view suffering as a kind of um, unalloyed evil, which has no redemptive quality at all. Because you know, for us, you know, pleasure is the only the only thing to live for. Mm -hmm. And so, if you if you're if you're living a pleasureless life, you might you you know you're better off dead, and you might as well you know kill yourself. So it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. Just one more one more thing about this. Um, so watch at all times. So discern what's outside. Discern what's in as inside as well. And then that relates to just the final thing I wanted to say, which is about living a holy life. You know, that's that's the point is, you know, we can get um, very preoccupied with the events in the world or trying to interpret them or predicting when Christ is coming back. But really, what we're called to do is live a holy life and, and to focus on on that. You know, so Christ says, look up, um, raise your heads. Mm. That in light that's of the very fact, important, very yeah. important, isn't it? Um, yeah. In light of the fact. The, um, go on. No, so th th think. If you've ever been to um, Italy and you see the the, the Pompeii figures, the, these terrified figures yeah. uh, of the great Roman Empire, crushed yeah. by this you know this, this sudden natural disaster, um, and I think raise your heads is you know in the face of even the greatest even a great disaster, mm. the, the call of Christ is for us as Christian people to. To be, to be full, you know, to be full of the spirit, to uh, to be confident in in Him while everything else is going crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and to live live in light of the fact that Christ will return at some point, and it, it is going to be like a thief in the night. In the night, when you you know you don't know it's going to happen, and so what you do in the in the meantime is you watch, you stay awake, you live a holy life. You discern what you're allowing into your mind. You discern what's going on in your soul. And that's your primary, that's the main thing you should be doing. So when we, I mean, we're about to go and talk about, you know, events, you know, geopolitical events and to offer our take on them, you know, in various different ways and everything like that. But without that orientation, you're going to get, you're going to get deceived mm -hmm. by the enemy and something's going to happen and you're going to, you know, you'll be blown off course and then spiritually you'll be in a dark place. So you've got to have that kind of core sense of, holiness commitment to christ focus on what god calls us to you know regardless of what's going on in the world and i i i'm sure you'd agree with me daniel as well when when we say like there are people who are kind of you know in a similar space to us in terms of the way they might re read the kind of geopolitical i know what you're going to say yeah. yeah but they but they do get you know they get sidetracked and they get there's too much emphasis on this or that sort of theory of what's going on and there's not enough emphasis on what's going on in the soul and they can end up in a very very dark absolutely. place you know absolutely and i think again i think what we're doing as um new writers and mm. podcasters is trying to speak into that space powerfully mm. uh, uh that in comparison to all the troubles of the world the the infinite majesty of god the yeah. son of the vision of the son of man is minuscule, infinitely minuscule compared to the glory of God. This is not Star Wars where there's the dark side uh, and the light side and they're sort of yin-yang equal. Yeah. Uh, what we are talking about here in Christianity is the good news that God uh, is you know, all-powerful, almighty, omnipotent, all-loving. Uh, and, um, you know, if you think X, Y, or Z people, whether it's 
what's happening at the moment uh, in the Middle East or whether you've got concerns about technocracy, Klaus Schwab, the Chinese Communist Party, whatever, whoever yeah. you see as bad actors, these are nothing in comparison to the glory of God. They yeah. are not even anywhere near an equal footing, but it would be so easy through the, you know, the algorithms of our phone to think, oh, you know, in this battle, it's, it's a bit kind of iffy yeah. where it's going to go. No, it's not iffy. Christ yeah. has won. He's won on the cross and he's going to win again. And yeah. at his return, all things will be complete. Yeah, I, I do agree. I totally agree with yeah. that, Daniel. And I think also um, recognizing that the real battle for us is the battle within. You know, the dragon mm. is within us. You know, it's, it's the line that mm. runs down our uh, the middle that, of our hearts. You know, I, that is where Armageddon is fought. Mm. It, it's it's not on the plains of Megiddo. It's in your soul. Mm. And that's uh, what and that's what we're called to. And you know, I think as well that's the that's the other thing. I think the great spiritual. One of the great spiritual challenges here is about recognizing when we are tempted to use some kind of activism or outrage or something like that to justify our own sin. That's a really important thing. You know, it's it's a very easy thing to do to think, well, I can I can allow my soul to fall into this kind of sinful pattern because I'm outraged about something that's going on out there. Now, the outrage may in, in many ways be justified, but what is not justifiable is allowing yourself to fall into sin. You know, yeah, I mean, let, 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 anger, let, let, self-righteousness, you know, all of these yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, let's, you know, I, I think it would be very easy, wouldn't it, to be, um, say, as a young adult, to be caught up in um, in a kind of anti-woke activism mm. where you start trolling people, um, you start being, you know, in, Incredibly egregious um, from the from the safety of your phone, or, or even worse, you know, start uh, doing doing things that are are particularly against the law in a very in in a very sort of uncivilized way, you know, using um, horrible language, yeah. um, actually in many ways mirroring the other side. Yeah, we don't want you to do that. We, mm. we want to raise, we want to see God raise godly men and women who are different, yeah. who, you know, <laughs> who present themselves as balanced, spirit-filled people, discerning, awake, uh, but, but also magnanimous, generous and orthodox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and I think, I think that's, that's right, isn't it? It's about what's out there. But it's, it's it's also about what's in here, and and actually that's a fundamental. Like that that's without that, you know, you're you're going to have the wrong perspective on what's out there. No, it's the G.K. Chesterton thing, isn't it? What what what's wrong with the world, Mister Chesterton? Me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm I'm the problem with the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Daniel, I think that said, uh, we we could now, you know, hopefully in a, with a greater degree of spiritual safety. Um, go on to talk about this and it does it does refer to what christ is saying because he's you know he does he does say watch at all times and he he speaks about discerning the signs of the times and everything like that um and we're going to talk about of course the hamas attacks on israel and i don't know how you feel about this daniel but i feel um a sense of trepidation because mm -hmm. i feel like um un i feel unsure about this in many ways i sort of feel like this is a really complicated a geopolitical situation which i you know, I, I understand a bit but I, I i don't want to sort of sit here and, and pretend that i know everything about what's going on it reminds me a little bit of i mean it's different obviously but it reminds me a little bit of when the ukraine russia war started as well and this this huge big thing begins and then suddenly the media is in your face the social media is in your face everyone's in your face and it's almost like there's all this pressure 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 to kind of you know take a really sort of firm and certain line about every single aspect of it so we're sort of i mean i'm just saying this all by way mm. of preamble just to describe my feelings about it really um so my hope for this conversation is that this this will be a kind of meaning making conversation mm. where we can kind of you know through through speaking to each other um come to a come to a sort of greater level of understanding of our own thoughts and and of this situation in general so i mean that's do you have anything sort of to say as yeah i mean you preamble know about it one can almost imagine a wormwood screw tape conversation yeah uh, where 
the perfect, you know, hell designs the perfect event to divide to to really highlight the division between left and right, um, so that you know every household in Europe are going to have contrasting opinions mm. on this. Yeah, um, and it, it, it this sort of amplifies that this. Well, then that's what I've noticed on social media is that um, this really sort of has cut into the, between the bone and the marrow. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, it, there, there's something kind of quite demonic really about this event and the way yeah. that it, the way that it is spaghettifying us. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah. And I, I, I would say as well, James, I've, not... I've never, I've never seen anything quite like, quite, yeah. quite like that. You know, where, where you know, you've got, you've got d- different sides. Uh, yeah. And I think I've got a, I think I particularly, I, I pretty much know where I am on um, my my opinions and sympathies to a degree. But um, that, that's an extraordinary thing to see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to say, sorry to interrupt you, but I was going to say, I don't think it's only between left and right, although it is, but it's within mm. particular kind of political outlooks as well, I would mm. say, because on, you know, our side of things in terms of um, the way, you know, we saw COVID and the way we've got kind of a, a sort of inbuilt scepticism about, you know, the, you know, in capital letters, the current thing. Um, there's also a sense in which it sort of divides people who have taken those kind of viewpoints as well, because some people are apt to see it as, you know, a straightforward um, attack, you know, f- by by the guilty upon the innocent, whereas other people are, are, are inclined to see Israel as um, a bad actor or even as complicit in what's in what's happened. So you can see all these different takes sort of emerge all at once, and particularly on Twitter, you can see this, like, and just this sort of this viciousness. Um, that that exists between all sides, and the sort of yeah, as you say, it's hard to sort of imagine a more emotional. Yeah, I, I got a, I got attacked this morning on Twitter, right? On, on exactly on that, you know, on, on the sort of basis, I suppose, someone's like saying, well, as as if if I've got this right, that this essentially all been fabricated, you know, in the same way that you might say the moon landings have been fabricated in, in that in that particular you know narrative, yeah. Uh, and that this is all part of some, you know, grand plan, uh, and um, uh, and and so you know, all we're going to have now is propaganda from all sides of the media. Uh, and, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think yes, there's going to be propaganda, but I think Hamas are most likely. This has not been filmed on, or photoshopped. That actually, I think. The likelihood is that they really have done some pretty horrific things in the yeah. last few so, years. I mean, this is this is the kind of fog of war type stuff, isn't it, mm. that we're we're getting into here? And I think it's probably right. Um, so sort of I think it's, I think we do have to offer some kind of, you know, some kind of update on our sort of current understanding of the situation. I, I suppose my sort of my reaction is that there are some things that I feel very sure about and then there are other things where I I'm not I'm not as sure about. So the things I find like I feel sure about is I mean clearly um clearly there has been you know this thing has happened and and there you know whereby um civilians including women and children have been murdered and raped and there are reports of you know babies being beheaded and things like that so that's happened at least to a very great degree there may be some propaganda there may be some exaggeration i think it's impossible to tell but certainly some of it's happened because you can watch i've watched some of the videos and they're absolutely appalling um and i think the you know we've got a a really interesting piece by Rod Dreher that we've both read called The Nazis of Our Time, where he's, you know, he's taking a very strong line on this. And I mean, one of the things that he's concerned about, and again, you can see it on social media, is the spontaneous support for Hamas, which has arisen in European cities, and where you've got demonstrations in major cities, you know, in London, across Europe, in um in Australia as well, people who have taken this as an opportunity to go to the streets in support of not only a free Palestine, but a but a but for Hamas specifically, and you've had journalists openly celebrating in what's happened. Uh, somebody on the on the Times 
radio extolling Hamas's bravery, the BBC refusing to call Hamas a terrorist group. There was somebody else, I forget who it was, but talking about, the, you know, having a, a, a saying this is a day for celebration. I think that was a British journalist. Mm. So this kind of thing. So l- let me just put it this way. Um, regardless of, you know, regardless of what the actual reality is on the ground, what actually happened, these people still think that this happened. I mean, I think it happened as well. You know, I'm not I'm not saying nothing happened, but these people presumably think that civilians were murdered, including women and children, and babies were murdered and, you know, people's houses were broken into and families were butchered and everything like that. They think that that happened. That's what they believe has happened. And they've gone out on the streets to celebrate it and to, to support the people who did it. And that, to me, is extremely disturbing uh, that you've got Western people who are that dehumanised that they, no, that, that they actually sort of think that this is acceptable behaviour. Post-Christendom politics. Yes. Yeah. You know, this is when everything is about calculation, utility, power, and dominance. Um, this, this is what you get. You know, you get the politics of the of the French Revolution. Um, yeah, but is, which, it, is it is it is it? Um, but is it Daniel? And again, I, I'm just you know, I'm just asking. I'm asking. Um, I'm asking the question. But it must be, and I, I do think there's there's stuff on the other side says well, but it must be a manifestation of of a deep anti-semitic hatred of of the jews i mean surely uh, i don't uh, you know i know there are people who say that you know the you know the israeli state plays up jewish identity in order to sort of protect itself and and to use the holocaust cynically and all of this kind of stuff but it might i mean it must exist mustn't it when you see this kind of thing happening on the street you think how could how could this not be born out of just a visceral hatred for not just for the state of israel but for for the Jews who live there specifically, and how can it not be linked to some kind of anti-Semitic feeling? I don't know. What do you think? What do you think about that? Because I, I honestly, I don't know. I'm not in that milieu. I don't know loads of, you know, sort of pro-Palestine, pro-Hamas people. Yeah. You know, I don't see that happening here in Winchester. Likewise, um, my, my grandmother had her teenage years in Nazi-occupied Brussels, and I think her her recollections twofold one was standing on the other side of the street you know 13 14 years old watching people with yellow stars yellow badges being put onto trucks Mm. and everybody just putting the head down trying to ignore it normalizing it uh, as they were taken away clearly to concentration camps uh, and this extraordinary sense of the banality of evil. Mm. that, And the second one was that f- the way that Jews were portrayed, particularly at that time, and I think this is now more subconscious, that this was a successful minority, uh, yeah. a, mi- a minority that had done well for it, itself. And as we know, a lot of hard left, particularly hard left politics and revolution Easters have... I mean, Orwell comes out with this, doesn't it? It's not so much that they have a care for the poor, but they have an envy yeah. for the world to do, for those who have been successful. Um, and um, that's a, I, th- I think that's a very deep, that's a, that's a very deep thread that runs through European history is this disdain for, you know, for minority that have been very entrepreneurial, um, that have given a lot to um, European life, um, that uh, don't necessarily stand out, but could easily then be seen in, in conspiratorial ways as you know the enemy within, because they hold too much power in inverted commas, you know, mm. um, and um, you know in in hard times, it, it's very easy, I think, to scapegoat. Mm. Do you think um, I, I've been listening to um, Joe Boots podcast uh, early this morning and Joe like takes a very strong line on this and says he thinks that I mean, he he because he's coming from a reformational perspective, 
um, he eschews the kind of the notion that the Jews are a sort of parallel to the church in this age, you know, in that, you know, God has sort of two covenants, one with the Jews and one with the Christians, and that, you know, the Christian church is really the fulfillment of Israel. Um, and that to be to be honest, that that would be my theological position as well. But but then Joe says very strongly that nevertheless, um, the Jewish people are a reminder of the God of the Bible, they're a reminder of God's covenant, his faithful promises, and 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 the land itself is a reminder of of all of those things as well. And that therefore there's a kind of spiritual, there's a sort of spiritual aspect to this whereby this is almost like a kind of diabolical manifestation of hatred towards towards the the people of God because of what they represent, even if they even if they're not sort of full members of the church or oh. I don't know. What what do you what do you make of that kind so, of take? So what he's saying is then it's essentially a backdoor to a hatred of God. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And he's and just to be really, really clear about it, um, he's saying that it's an Islamic it's, an, it's, it's, it's fundamentally something which is Islamic in nature. You know, it's, it, it can't be understood. The whole thing can't be understood in kind of secular political terms. That this is a this is a, a manifestation of the ideology of Islam in its uh, its hatred of Judaism and the Western nations, which are at least historically associated with with Christianity and the, and the Christian worldview. So that's it. And, yeah. and, you know, he couches that around, you know, he says he's, oh. he, he, he says it in a nuanced way. And it's important to say that in saying that he's also saying that obviously Muslims as individuals are their own people who have got their own sort of feelings and hopes and dreams and everything like that. You know, so it's important not to sort of abstract the problem and to say, well, it's just about this sort of, you know, this free floating ideology. I mean, we're talking about we're talking about real people who have different kind of approaches to it all of whom might call themselves Muslims. But he's saying that the ideology, the ideology of Islam is, is properly and consistently understood in this way. So that, that's what he's saying. Uh, I've, I've been reading the um, biography of, um, the two-part biography of uh, Benedict XVI. And um, I, I remember at the time in 2006, the... Uh, the Regensburg Address, which you know got him into hot water because of its, um, he was trying to prize open the, the whole sort of religious landscape and the difference, I suppose, between Christianity and Islam in in terms of its understanding of, particularly of of, of power and authority, um, violence, um, mm. the the law of the law of God, um, and I think if I've if I've read this right, the Rosenberg speech insists that God is reasonable in the Christian vision. Yeah, God cannot act against reason, uh, and um, this, this contrasts to a sort of Quranic understanding, mm. where you know if. If God wants to make light darkness, then He can, you know, and, and that, um, and you can get to a certain point where you can justify a certain dominance and violence uh, on scales which seem incomprehensible to the Judean Christian tapestry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I. I can remember reading at the time, and I've been sort of going back on it, and I, and I think, I think it was actually a, a, a prophetic speech, mm. despite all the bad press that it that it that it got, and um, and that what he is saying about peace and violence and a Christian understanding of God's law and God's heart is um, is, is quite profound actually, and quite profound to this time. You know, okay, it's you know, it's a highbrow piece of work. <laughs> Uh, um, but it, it's the sort of quantum mechanics, really, that theology needs for the 21st century. Yeah. Uh, so, so I mean, if I just elaborate or elaborate what I think I'm hearing you say there. So, are 
humanity's view or society's view of, of who God is and sort of what how he relates to creation will to his creation will will manifest itself in some kind of consistent way. So in in the sort of Christian worldview, I mean this is the way I would put it anyway. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if it's exactly doing justice for what to what um Benedict would have said, but you know, in, in the Christian worldview, you've got a God is fundamentally loving, a God who's fundamentally just and good and truthful, and he's bound by those characteristics. So he can't he can't not he can't just sort of capriciously decide to mm. change and to manifest himself as as fundamentally evil or deceptive or something like that. Whereas in the Christian, in the Islamic view, um, Allah is much more of a kind of um voluntaristic God. So power is power is the way that he manifests himself and he may manifest himself as light he may manifest himself as darkness and the the whole notion of islam is about submission to the will of allah you know complete submission mm-hmm. to him and so then it's it it doesn't it's not necessarily that surprising therefore when the sort of political manifestation of islam is fundamentally about force and, and violence and the overwhelming of people who will not submit um uh, you know, with with by any means necessary, I suppose. Which is completely in contrast to say the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Yeah, you know, your kingdom on earth, as it is in heaven. Um, yeah. lead us not into temptation. You know, all, all the we we come for daily bread. We don't come for we don't come before God um, looking for a lottery win. <laughs> or Rolls Royce to turn up or for the um the absolute destruction of all our enemies yeah that we might gleefully enjoy uh you know uh, and in the epistle to St John isn't it god is love and those who live in love live in god 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 is that reason is that love he yeah um yeah. and i think this is again this goes back to our sense of the incarnation that Christ becomes one of us, he becomes a human being, he inhabits those values. Mm. Um, and he calls us not servants or slaves. He calls us not submissives. He calls us friends. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, there is that submission motif. Uh, in a Mary says, I am behold, I am the, the servant of the Lord, but, Ultimately, we're called into divine friendship, mm. into a union. And I think the, the, the Ravensburg speech is highlighting this schism yeah. between Christianity. Very, you know, there is this very wide gap. And we cannot but not see that. So can't paper over that. As I yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm with you. So, I mean, one one question, you know, sort of meaning making question, I suppose, would be, um, well, I mean, uh, what do we make of this sort of alliance between the sort of radical left and groups like Hamas? You know, if we, it, it, on, on the one hand, it's fairly straightforward, isn't it? If you say, well, Islam is, you know, Islam is this way and it has this kind of ideology and it, it manifests itself in the world in, in this kind of fairly straightforward way. Um, what do we make of the what do we make of the alliance between the radical left and Islam? Now, the sort of the the, the surface level explanation, yeah, which presumably a leftist would would give, is that the Jews stole the land of Israel from the Palestinians, uh, and that you know you've seen I've seen this phrase repeated you know countless times on social media in the last couple of days that the that the Palestinians live in an open air prison in Gaza. That they're subjugated by the Jews. That they're, you know, that the the Israeli state is a, you know, is a racist, genocidal state, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they're and and they're doing what they need to in order to liberate themselves from the oppressive yoke of Israel. Um, but I suppose my question is, you know, is that is that sort of um, explanation? Does that really sort of account for the? the the manifestation of support for Hamas, for example, the seeming seeming mm. kind of extremity of this of this response, there seems to me to be a something a lot more powerful to it than just a sort of you know a straightforward kind of observation that you know that the that the Palestinians are treated badly by by these by the Israeli state. I, but I don't know. What what do you think? Mm. 
I, I, I think I know where you're where you're coming. I mean, I'm not meaning that in a lead. I'm not meaning it in a leading uh, way. I'm just trying to articulate my kind of feelings about it. Mm. You know, I was watching a a, a um, clip with Owen Jones earlier, and it's like, on the one hand, he he pays lip service. He says, you know, obviously these things are terrible and they shouldn't happen. But it's like he can't wait to get to the next thing, mm. which is yeah, well, there's they a live- but. Yeah, but, but they live in but, an open air prison. You know, yeah, the Israeli but, state are yeah. now killing children in Par- pa- in in um, in Gaza. You know, they're just as bad. It's they're worse, in fact. Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. It's like there's this sort of inability on the part of these people to just say this is just unbelievably evil, and and that's you know for that part of the conversation, that's just the end of it. Like it's completely unjustifiable. We're not going to try and sort of say you know. And within this context, it's a little bit more understandable or something like that. If you go around, you know, like killing children or, you know, locking children in cages or beheading babies or something like that, you can't support that. It's like saying it's like saying, well, you know, the Nazis were really bad, but they did actually have some legitimate geopolitical aims. You just can't Mm. say things like that. Yeah, they and, um, you know, they built motorways. Yeah. Yeah, or or, uh, or 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 saying, well, like, yeah, but what about the Treaty of Versailles? I mean, that was really bad. So, of course, they had a right to sort of rearm and defend themselves. You just don't say things like that when you're talking about something like the Holocaust. Or so you don't say, oh, the Holocaust was terrible, but I really have to say this thing about the Treaty of Versailles. You know, you don't say that. It's just not. It's not acceptable. And it's not Mary ha- Mary Harrington in a, in a tweet today has um, noticed how you know post Second World War we all have this aversion to the horror of fascism, and that morphs itself in the end that we become the very fascists we don't we seek to avoid in in political extremities like the hard left. Mm. Um, that it, it becomes about our, our conversations become about dominion at, at any price. So is that because we sort of you know fascism is about binding binding people together within the nation state, isn't it? You know, nothing outside of the state, everything within the state, to quote um, uh, Mussolini. But then the kind of anti-fascism thing can kind of become a way of binding people together as well, another another form of kind of mm. in, binding... In, oppress- in oppressive categories. Yeah, yeah. No, I see well, that. I mean, and, and you, end, you end up with this sort of daft stuff, like, you know, like, um, you know the, the, the trope that's gone round queers for Palestine. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's, un- that's unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the naivety of that is, is, is extraordinary, you know, because for all of Israel's fault, um, you know, if, if uh, in, in the state of Israel, you can go and vote out the government um, as, you know, as a pregnant trans man, Christian evangelist driving a car. You can go to the ballot box and make your vote, and probably then in the evening put yourself forward as a contestant for for Eurovision. You cannot do that in Gaza or the West Bank without being in real hot water. Oh, you would just be executed if you were going around yeah. like with a rainbow flag. You would just have your head cut off. I mean, it's mm. just. But there, there's interesting, isn't it? Because um, there, this this relates to the sort of conversation about how we make meaning of any kind of ethical judgments at all. And it demonstrates the the folly of, of moral relativism, doesn't it? Because you've got people who sort of feel that certain things are right and wrong. So they feel, for example, that the occupation of, of Palestine um, or of Israel, whatever you want to call it, is, is, is wrong. They feel that very strongly, but then they also feel that the, that the, that the project of gay liberation is correct as well. And so they've got these two sort of completely contradictory beliefs, mm. but they've got nothing. They've got no overarching framework to refer them to because they ultimately don't believe in any kind of objective yeah, truth. The, the two things don't fit together in the same yeah. way that the whole sort of um, hijab thing doesn't fit together. You know, and of um, course it doesn't. Uh, uh, but there's but there's no there's no um, there's all it is is a, just a manifestation of kind of individual feeling, and it's completely. Of course, it's absurd mm. when you stand outside of it. But like the the people who hold these beliefs must have lost the ability to actually see the the absurdity of of holding of holding to those beliefs as though you know they could in England support the the project of gay liberation, but in in uh, free Palestine they could support a Palestinian state run by Hamas, where mm, yeah, gay mean, people you know, are executed. Oh, you have 
you know, Gaza is it's, it's as if if you can imagine Northern Ireland run by the IRA uh, in in the nineteen nineties, where there's no police. <laughs> it's just a case of if you're considered to be you know if you're not the right sort of criminal, you're going to get your legs broken. Mm. Yeah, um, it, it's it's. It's a state run by barren robbers because that's the way that it's that's the way that it's evolved. When it it could so easily in an, in another turn of events, if history had played out differently, somewhere like Gaza could have been like Dubai. Mm. Why isn't it? You know, why isn't it like that? I mean, it's extra, it's extraordinary. Um, um, yeah. So um, Roger Ayer said in his piece, we've got a key quote here. Once Israel's attack on Gaza ramps up, I feel that a lot. I fear that a lot of European cities will burn. Europeans have been complete fools to allow so many Islamic migrants into their countries. What they're celebrating doing to Jews in Israel today, they will celebrate doing to Christians and secular Westerners in Europe tomorrow. What more do you need to know? There it is, right in front of you. So that's part of of Dreyer's day. Yeah. It's interesting actually because last week we were talking about. I was talking with Tom on the podcast about, you know, these these kind of, you know, in, in context, seemingly quite sort of mild comments now made by Suella Braverman about how multiculturalism has failed. And it seems to me that, I mean, d- depending on how you define the word multiculturalism, but if you define it as a kind of attempt to have several different cultures living within the same space without a dominant culture, then I don't think there's any greater um, manifestation needed to to de- to show why multiculturalism as a product as a project is is a failure. I mean, it, not only is it a failure, but yeah. it could actually bring about the the tearing apart of the fabric of of these Western countries, including our country, um, as we see this this ramp up. I mean, some some aspects of multiculturalism where have have worked. I think in terms of, I, I would say. Clearly, that there is a, a a very entrepreneurial, hardworking, um, post-empire Indian community within Britain who have generally kind of worked hard to fit in, and I'll probably say the same for some Africans um, and you know people from Asia and China who get you know good grades at school. Uh, who contributes to the, the economy, but where we've got this different operating system, where we've got folks coming angry <laughs> and militant, it's it's a disaster. I don't know what to do. I, I, well, I, don't, I mean, the, there the is thing, a solution, is there? I mean, how can, it's, the, it almost the, feels like it's too late. Well, I think it's too late, but uh, that's why I said the thing about. Um, well, I mean, there are probably things we could do to mitigate against how much of a disaster it's going to be, but whether anyone will actually do them is is another question. But that's why I said the thing about um, the definition of multiculturalism, because there are there are at least, I think, two ways of defining multiculturalism. And there's also another thing which you might call multi-ethnicism, uh, which is about you know the, the the success of many ethnicities living together within a sin- single culture. And you could you could point towards um, the U.S. For that, and you could say that's an example of, well, at least until latterly, an example of you know a successful multi-ethnicism where you have genuinely different ethnicities all together, you know, forming a roughly speaking coherent nation. The multicultural thing, I think, um, I think it, it can it can work to a degree um, if you have a situation whereby when people come to the the nation, there is a kind of um, expectation that the nation. Has a has a dominant uh, sort of norming ideology. In our case, it would be mm-hmm. Christianity, and other and other minorities within within that ideology will respect that. That they will engage with it to a to a very de- great degree. For example, they'll they'll like speak speak the same language. For example, uh, they'll they'll um, be at least educated to some degree in the in the knowledge and understanding of the 
the dominant culture. And as a minority, they'll be respected and they'll be allowed to operate in freedom. You know, they have religious freedom and so on and so forth. But there has to be this understanding that there's some kind of normative culture that they're buying into. And again, you can see that in America as well, where they have, mm. um, you know, certain tests that you have to pass before you come, become a citizen and all that kind of thing. And also, you know, in places like France, I mean, they've got huge problems as well. But, you know, in France, there is a there is a, a very strong emphasis on um, on the French language, for example, you know, and, and having, um, you know, for ex- it's just a silly example in some ways, but having a certain amount of songs in French on the radio and that kind of stuff. There's a, there's a sense that the French language carries something of their cultural identity. Now, I think the problem we have in the in the UK, especially, and I don't know why why we have it here in particular, but we seem to have this sort of hatred of of our own culture, probably to do with like the British Empire and Christianity and stuff like that, rejection of our past. But this kind of hatred of our, as though everything British is like necessarily racist and bad and everything like that. And if we if we insist that we actually have a culture which is worthy of preservation and protection, then we're necessarily racist. And so what that kind of multiculturalism ends up being is a situation in which you just have sort of basically unfettered immigration and no attempt at integration or at having any kind of dominant norming culture. And then you have all of these groups living side by side. And as you say, some of them might be groups that positively contribute to society, but but some of them might be radical Islamic groups or other types of groups who are just going to come in and either just create chaos, you know, on a criminal scale, or they're going to, you know, literally they've got an ideology which is about infiltrating and and taking over a civilization and i think that that's that's a, a massive problem for multiculturalism in terms of islam because that mm. islam is a much stronger ideology than secularism in that sense now we were having on on college weren't we we were having a conversation about whether secularism actually has the capacity to hollow out islam mm. you know and may, secularists might see that as like civilizing islam but that's a hell of a gamble to take isn't it you know to like, just allow unfettered Im- islamic immigration into your country and think well you know our culture will have a kind of civilizing leavening effect on them because what if it doesn't you know and what if what if the 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 momentum of of the islamic population actually grows and as as michelle welbeck imagines in his book submission that eventually you get an islamic toehold into the the political system and then you're you're on the you're on the you're on the road towards sharia law and islamic society so do you see do you see what i mean I think yeah no no absolutely i think two things i'd say first is um re- recounting a, a a friend years ago who said that um leaving india his father was incredibly excited as they were coming to britain saying son this is the you know the heart of the empire. This is a really important country to come to. Yeah, this is this is this is an amazing people, a great country, um, and you know we should be um, honoured and humbled to cross these shores. And I thought, gosh, that's that's amazing. Why why don't we say that more? It, you know, so indigenous English we don't hear. Yeah, yeah. We rarely hear that, uh, and. You know, this this friend of mine who became a Catholic priest said his father, who ended up as a Harley Street doctor, was astonished at, at the British lack of uh, you know self worth and uh, less fair really to to their their own identity because he'd grown up seeing this as the you know the great country the New Jerusalem. Uh, and in fact, his his sort of values and his manner were were actually wonderfully Victorian. You know, mm. he, you know, literally everything did stop at four for tea, and why didn't the rest of us stop and do the same thing? You know, and yeah. I, I just think, gosh, you're more British than I am, uh, and, and that there was something instructive uh, in that, and that's very different, as you say, from um, others coming in and not having that that um, that excitement. For a for a country and saying you know this is going to enrich me, this yeah. is going to make me a better person. Um, well, it's, or it's not, or it's just out, outright hostility, isn't it? Right, is you know, not, just, not just a yeah. lack of excitement, <laughs> an uh, excitement uh, about about causing chaos and taking over. Yeah, uh, I, I suppose the second thing I I, I would say just uh, on our uncolored episode is 
I, I wasn't so much saying that I felt that secularism had the capacity to hollow out Islam, but but actually a sort of a new religion. I mean, this is what Douglas Murray says: we're on the verge of a, um, a, a potentially a, a a godless religion, a sort of religion of the self. You know, a, mm. an algorithmic uh, religion has uh, the potential to hollow out everything that doesn't deeply, deeply hold on to humanity. And um, for, for all its um, bolshiness, I I do think that, you know, a sort of post-secularist machine could actually um, uh, eviscerate um, most relig- all other religions bar, bar a sort of <laughs> a, a traditional form of Christianity. Yeah, so a kind of antichrist um, technocracy, mm. globalist anti antichrist technocracy. That, mm. yeah, it's interesting because one of the books that's really influenced me over the last few years in my thinking, and you know, which I've mentioned on the podcast a few times, is um, uh, Slaviev's A Short Tale About the Antichrist. Mm. I don't think he even exactly. Really, yeah, yeah, I don't know it. if he yeah. even mentions. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't yeah. know if he even mentions Islam in it. To be honest, he probably does somewhere at the beginning. But that's a kind of imagine imagining of of the of the of the end times, which is it it does happen as a result of a globalist technocracy. But in um in uh, Daniel O'Brien's books about the end times, so like Father Elijah and Elijah in Jerusalem, which I've just meant, uh, which I've just read, which are similarly kind of ima- uh, an imaginative. Um, fictional narrative about the very end. The Antichrist is actually somebody who comes and brings about peace between religions. So peace between the world religions, particularly Judaism and Islam in the Holy Land. Um, but he does so through uniting them in the worship of himself. And that's that's the key thing is he promises peace, but it's peace if the kingdoms of the world will bow down and worship him. So that's enough, and then and then and then he becomes the kind of focal point of a of a globalist religion, essentially. So it's almost like the kind of techno or the technocratic globalist digital aspect, you know, the kind of digital surveillance state aspect that comes together with this kind of secularized, immanentized, um, pluralist religion. And again, you can you can kind of see all this, you know, these these. I think these books are incredibly. I mean, obviously, the Bible and the Book of Revelation is is insightful but these books are incredibly insightful because i think you kind of see this stuff don't you see like the major world religions pushing in this direction when you get a certain way up the pyramids you know like with the pope or with um you know to a certain extent our archbishops as well with the even with the you know ecumenical patriarch in in the east uh and then and then with the other religions you know in in um in islam and judaism you know i'm thinking particularly is was it in abu dhabi that that sort of interfaith temple complex that's been set set up all these all these people at the sort of pinnacle of these religions support this you know and they're sort of intentionally ambiguous about what's actually being said you know they call them the abrahamic faiths because they're trying to bring a kind of imminentized unity between them so i don't know it strikes me as i don't know what you think about that that strikes me as quite plausible in terms of the way things will you know and the challenge there for the with a Christian view is to say, no, actually, we 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 insist on the distinctiveness of Christianity and its truth, and the fact that you know Christ is, you know, the world was made through Christ for him, by him, that he will return to mm. judge the living and the dead, that he's the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lords, Lord of Lords, and that we don't believe that Judaism and Islam are come, kind of manifestations of the same perennial religious truth. I don't know what what what, what do you think? I, I think the realignment in religious and spiritual thought in the 21st century, if I were to make a a guess, is going to be between those who hold to the profoundness of humanity and those who don't, mm. and those who are ready to sell that out um, and um, sell it for a pottage and I think that it's within Christianity that there is the the, the beacon of light, and that uh, I, I think that that's the division. I don't think it's a, even a division between, you know, saying on this. I don't think it's a case of Abrahamic faiths and monotheists and uh, and others. I think it's those who are, 
clearly want the human project to go on and those who aren't that bothered. So, Daniel, can we you just put some flesh on the bones there? Because, of course, um, the kind of, you know, the sort of secular humanists would say that they believe in humanity and you could almost characterize their view as mm. as a religion of humanity. So. So what do you mean? What do you mean there? I mean, nobody's saying we need to abolish humanity, are they? What, what? Well, do, do, do you not think if you look at some of the extreme environmental um, theologies that are coming out and philosophies, which uh, look, look at um, the human species as as a disease on the planet, um, even even Dawkins himself and uh, uh, similar voices around him have said that we might only have a century left in terms of we might evolve into something else. Yeah, uh, and and if if we don't if we don't watch out on that, that may you know, that could be very well the, the way that we the majority of people choose to to be. I mean, I think again, it's it's a very strong trope in Paul King's North's work and Mary Harrington and others. Um, that abandonment of humanity for something supposedly better. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and, and I'm not just talking about AI there, but a, a, just a general sense of, well, does it really matter? Yeah. And it, so, it's a lot of people in science will be talking about this and say, well, you know, perhaps we all just evolve into our machines and perhaps that's just better. And once you start to kind of let that that thought dribble round. Well, you know, if, if it doesn't matter, if we don't matter, then it doesn't matter if you slaughter people because you're just, you know, progressing um, away. You're, you're just, you know, you're just, you're just progressing uh, uh, away from a, a deeper understanding of human beings and what they are. Yeah. So, but when when you say human beings, there you mean sort of human beings upon a Christian understanding of what humanity mm. is, and I think that's the mm. key thing, isn't it? Is that you know there are various different anthropologies, like view of what human beings are, and there there are there are anthropologies like transhumanism, which would actually say that their view of humanity is a very sort of highly exalted view of humanity because it's a, it, it, you know, humanity has a kind of capacity to divinize itself within the within the historical mm. timeline you know that we can actually bring ourselves to a to a higher level um so we so it's yeah it's, but what gets in the way of that is the idea of the soul is that, yeah. that the profound christian idea that we you know we are we are uh, we have the image of god we have a consciousness um we have a conscience uh we have subjectivity um we, we are clearly the you know the highest level animal <laughs> on the planet yeah, and and it's also that this is, uh, you know, the Christian view is that humanity is divinized through the supernatural mm. intervention of God in Jesus Christ, and that we don't, we can't do it ourselves because of the the limitations mm. of sin and the fallen environment that we live in. Uh, and and you can see that how the eugenics movement in the early part of the twentieth century also, you know, drove some of this, and then we had a break, and now I think we're coming back to. Yeah, we had a break so, because so, of the Nazis. Yeah, yeah, and, that, and now we're coming back to a, a different version of that. Yeah, but but the break hasn't interestingly hasn't it doesn't seem to have dampened people's enthusiasm for euthanasia, does it? Which is an interesting. No, exactly. Point. You know, we've we've yeah. had we we were sort of against um, you know forced sterilization and sort of overt genet, um, eugenics, but euthanasia is still very much in vogue. And I would I would argue as well that I think I think um, eugenics is is practiced in our nations it's just not called eugenics like screening for children with down syndrome mm -hmm. and then killing them in the womb is you is a form of eugenics isn't it so we you know it's not even true that we we don't practice it. it's just we don't call it that kind of language anymore um mm. should we just just return to this uh geopolitical issue just just for a minute um just want to say something about the kind of fog of war type stuff and again you know i'm just i'm just voicing just a just a sense here and I, I, I partly i'm doing this because i know that people who listen to our podcast will this will chime with some of them but you know this podcast started because really you know what was going on with the covid stuff was so distressing to many people and we felt that 
we'd lost the capacity to trust the establishment to tell us the truth about things. And many of us came to a, a deep, uh, a place of deep skepticism about the corporate media, especially. And, you know, my take would be that since then, we've seen this sort of current thing style. I don't even know what to call it. The sort of current thing style emphasis or manipulation or propaganda, whereby it it feels very much like, you know, something is kind of dangled in front of our eyes. You know, like first it was COVID. Um, then it was, um, was it Ukraine next? I can't remember. But, Black Lives Matter. Oh, yeah. Black Lives Matter. Then it was Ukraine. And, you know, tomorrow it'll be, you know, then, then it'll be something else. And it, it, and the the way that one of the things that's tricky about this is it's not to say that any of these things are completely illegitimate in themselves or anything like that. There are varying degrees of legitimacy to all of them. Uh, well, you know, some of them far less than others, I would say. But anyway, not not getting into that. The point is, is that there are lots and lots of things going on in the world all the time. But it seems like there's a sort of... <sighs> There's a sort of coalescence around various sort of hot button issues, which is just sort of thrust into our realm of consciousness in a very, very aggressive way. And it seems to change very, very quickly and and be and and, and it carries with it the sort of absolute insistence that you must, you know, you must go with the current thing. You must care about the current thing. You must support the current thing in this way. And if you don't, then you are, you know, a sort of, you know, you're an outcast, you're a deplorable you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that, uh, this isn't with any, you know, in any way to sort of take away from the horror. And I'm sure it's an absolute hell on earth what's going on in Israel. You know, I've got no, no, and, and in Gaza, I've got no, I've got no doubt about it. It's an absolute hell on earth. So I'm not in any way like taking away from it. But it very, it very much feels like the way the media has started to report this is like, this is the new current thing, you know, and, and you know, you must be consumed with this. And um, the, the, many people will feel um, cynical about this, like we're being manipulated, that there are purposes for this. There may be geopolitical purposes. There may be bad actors behind the scenes. You know, we've, we've, had, we've had people uh, suggesting that um, the Israelis may have allowed themselves to be attacked in this way, uh, which, again, it's just something that I've heard it articulated I'm not an, an expert in, you know, Israeli military technology, but that's certainly being raised as a as a question. Why, why was the response apparently so slow? Why is, is why was Israel so vulnerable when it's supposed to have the most sophisticated army in the world? What about the U.S. involvement in terms of the billions of uh, dollars that they've sent to Iran recently? Is there some is there something going on um, in terms of U.S. involvement? Does the U.S. want want an off ramp from do the, do the western nations want an off ramp from the ukraine russia conflict and and is this a convenient off ramp for them etc 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 so anyway daniel the reason i'm i'm just i'm just raising this because a lot of people will be kind of feeling um just concerned really i suppose that they're being manipulated that there's something you know there's there's something darker going on here and so on and so forth i don't know where we've got a take on any of that it's just mm. I just thought it was I think we go, but we go back to our scripture, don't we? About holding our heads up high, mm. being watchful, being balanced, not getting into um, anxiety, or not putting our brains into oblivion. <laughs> um, at, you know, that first and foremost, we focus on our souls, um, on the battle within. Um, yes, there may be ways in which this is manipulated into some kind of information war. Uh, I, I suppose what makes this slightly different is that it, it it really seems to have divided left and right, particularly, and confirmed suspicions maybe on our side of things uh, that um, people are quite easy in shrugging off atrocity mm. yeah. um for, for a certain cause uh and that we thought that there might eat that you know we presumed that there would be limits to what people would would say was acceptable behavior and we've found that 
um, that there's a constituency within Western civilization who are ready to take a blind eye and say, oh, well, the means justifies the ends. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, that, that does feel different, doesn't it? The sort of divisive nature of it and the unrest. It, feel, it feels a bit more 50-50 in mm. terms of the division, whereas I think the other current thing issues have been more 80-20. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it hasn't provoked the same kind of civil unrest, has it? And, I mean, I suppose Black Lives uh, Matter did a bit, but that was kind of establishment sponsored civil unrest, wasn't it? It was like the policemen were kind of joining in and stuff like that. Mm. Whereas this is like, you know, you've got the establishment coming out, you know, broadly speaking against the, I mean, Labour, there's always a bit of sort yeah. of amb ambiguity as to what Labour actually thinks and what they're actually prepared to say and do. But I mean, my, yeah. my suspicion is a bit like 9 11 that, that, uh, there will be an initial, it hasn't even really been massive in the way that it was for America, an initial, initial um, feeling of, you know, uh, compassion towards what what has happened that will swiftly turn, you know, as, as Israel uh, with its uh, military machine most likely goes full out, all guns blazing on this. Um and then I suspect that the narrative will be, uh, and I say this, you know, just for, uh, in, as much as a neutral observer as I'm trying to be, I suspect then that the narrative will be will be deeply uh, anti-Israel. Mm. What from the establishment, you think? No. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But, because I think that. Because I just think the me on the whole, the, the media story will be. Here's a here's a powerful country going in and bulldozing and bombing. Yeah, it certainly is irrespective of the atrocities, irrespective of the atrocities. I suspect that I suspect Israel's going to get a real beating in the news in the next few years. But yeah, yeah. Who knows? It, it this this could go I mean it could it could go anyway. It, it could escalate um, into a nuclear war, couldn't it quite? quite no i mean seriously god, i mean that forbid. that could, no, that god, could god forbid, yeah. it does really seem like we're living in a, yeah. in a in an age of wars and rumors of wars that's for sure i mean uh this no. is you know in terms of yeah. uh, the war between russia and ukraine and no, then, if you thought that took us to the precipice you know of yeah. this it, yeah you know, because one of the theories that's being put around is in the in the three-dimensional chess that's being supposedly played out is Hamas had to do something so awful that Israel couldn't but act. You know, it would be politically impossible for Netanyahu to uh, um, not throw everything he could at a retaliative response to this and that that would then disturb other regional powers to, uh, to a provocative, you know, um, response as well that, yeah and you could see how russia would want that to happen because it would mean that mm. the u.s and the western nations would would remove their emphasis from supporting ukraine to support yeah well, it's, it's very it's very want. difficult to to you know to do two to be involved in two two proxy wars one proxy war is is hard enough two proxy wars then then you get china and taiwan thinking well actually this is the perfect time to uh invade taiwan yeah. and get all that uh get, get get all that power to create top yeah. end silicon um you know, yeah well we've got three we, proxy wars so anyway let's yeah let's not be too doomsterish we certainly live in interesting um, times um, um and and while that's all going on daniel now to the Church, Church of England. Now you're going to say, Church of England. Again? The Church Can of England. Canterbury <laughs> Cathedral is uh, getting set to host a major event, um, the second only to the martyrdom of Thomas Abeka. Uh, they're going to host a 90s silent disco featuring Eminem, Britney Spears, and all Saints songs. Um, and yeah. this, this has uh, been uh, welcomed by the, the new dean, the very Reverend Dr. David Monteith. Did, did you see that he blocked Adrian Hilton? I did see that, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, to be fair, it might not have been him. I mean, he may not run the Canterbury Cathedral account. It's the Canterbury Cathedral account that blocked him, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, yeah, he said, I wrote a single polite tweet using the Dean 
oh, urging the dean, and then he's added the dean to reconsider your hosting of a disco. I did so quoting canon law perfectly respectfully. I'm a decades long member of the Church of England and frankly dismayed at this X X communication. Very clever. Um, the dean says about this uh, that the uh, dancing of all different kinds has happened, already happened in the cathedral over the years. Uh, oh, cathedrals yes. have always been a part of community life in a way much wider than their prime focus as centres of Christian worship and mission. We want to engage with the wide demographics that make up our local community. You know, when you hear that kind of waffle, I just want to put my my headphones down, go for a long walk and then come back, bang yeah. my head up against the vicarage wall. And think, what, what on earth, you know, I mean, hit me baby one more time and relight my fire yeah um, the cathedral uh, does have to raise large sums each year and we need to raise more he said well there our you go <laughs> our growing our growing program of <laughs> that events. was the subtext truth <laughs> there that was, that was the reason why we're doing it we're not doing it because we you know we really are into 90s music and we think yeah. that that might be some kind of interface to rave in the nave you know blah 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 um it's not no, it's we're not, doing it because we're doing it because there's a company that is putting this stuff out yep. around cathedrals and historic buildings. They're clearly offering a good buck uh, and we need the money. Yeah. I mean, and I've got to say, Daniel, I've just done a quick calculation. Um, the overall tickets, if they were sold at an average of £25 each for 750 people over two nights, that would bring in £37,500 without any overheads. So, mm. they, yeah, I mean, it's uh, let's say they made um let's say it costs you know 10 grand to put on the event i don't know whether it uh, well maybe let's say five grand because maybe 10 grand is too much but let's say they mm. earn thirty thousand from this i mean it's not very much in the grand scheme of things in terms of running a cathedral because cathedrals cost tens of thousands of pounds a day to keep over open so we're talking about you know maybe keeping the you know the the the, the total amount of money they need to keep the building open for a day so it's like you know is it really worth like desecrating your sacred space by doing such a thing i mean i you know really I, it is well apparently i worked as a virgin in uh, uh, a cathedral well the winchester cathedral no problem me saying it um and you know they did concerts in there and I, to be honest i didn't like it very much because i had to build all the staging but um you know there were sort of tasteful concerts which were actually sort of culturally valuable you know the worry here is that you're going to get a bunch of young people taking drugs getting pissed you know, um, mm. getting off with each other, uh, going home and sleeping with each other and, you know, listening to this less than edifying music. Uh, you know, I do like um, some 90s music, not not the 90s music that's on the billing here, I, I have to say. Um, it's, it's uh, you know... Uh, Are you not going to be or, in there with Saints? your placard saying free Britney? <laughs> M&M. <laughs> Uh, I'm just looking to see if there are any. No, I mean they're all. It's all like quite poppy stuff. I mean, I'd I prefer to see stuff. Oh, I suppose they've got Oasis. They're okay. Take that. Probably the best of the bunch there. But anyway, the point is, it really shouldn't be happening in a cathedral. And uh, there is a change petition, but to stop that happening. But to be honest, it doesn't have a huge amount of support. Um, maybe people don't care enough. I mean, to be honest, I don't really care enough to sign a petition. Yeah, there are only 135 signatures. I mean, it's not. It's not enough, frankly. Anyway, and then the other thing that's happened in the church this week is, of course, the the House of Bishops have um, agreed. Uh, what have they done? They've agreed to commend the prayers of love and faith, which are basically the prayers which are ostensibly about um, asking for God's blessing upon same-sex couples in churches. Now, Daniel, I don't know. Is there any sort of significance to this? Um, to this that you know the fact that the bishops have agreed it i i don't i I, I I got the sense that they've agreed to agree it but not until 2025 that there's a kicking of the ball for, right you know, the whole thing's being kicked into the long grass a bit oh, okay um but you know that's probably not going to stop the reverend whoever so just, just giving this... it a go but uh, there, there isn't an official text. There won't be an official text until it's 2025. And the Bishop Sarah Mullally had sort of said, you know, I know this, this, this delay is going to disappoint right. many people on the, on, um, you might say, the progressive side. Um, yeah. yeah. So in some ways, it's a, it's, a, it's a little victory for traditionalists in that it is being 
they're, they're saying yes, but it's going to take forever. So it creates a situation in which progressives will actually essentially um, sort of be, well, in some ways they'll be justified in using these prayers insofar as they know that the bishops are going to agree their use, but they won't have official permission. So it kind of creates and they're a not, they're not difficult situation. Finali- for them. They're not finalised. Yeah. I think what was put out in February is only examples of what it might look like. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've got it here. Today's meeting, the bishops agreed that, so three things, the prayers and readings in prayers of love and faith for use with same-sex couples will be commended by the House of Bishops for use in public worship. So they agreed that it will be commended, but not yet. Uh, Special standalone services set out in prayers of love and faith should be brought to the General Synod to decide whether to authorise them under Canon B2 after consultation with dioceses. Finally, there is also further work underway to explore further forms of pastoral reassurance and formal structural pastoral provision to ensure the conscience of everyone is respected. So there we go. One thing, Daniel, I just want to mm. read out just what um, one of the things that the Bishop of London said. Uh, I know that for some, these measures go too far and for others, not nearly far enough. And the bishops discuss the need for pastoral reassurance and for some, the need for formal structural pastoral provision. But the heart of the gospel is reconciliation. Our desire is to remain together as one church in our uncertainty, finding ways to live well with our dis- different perspectives and convictions. I just I think that doesn't really sit very well with me. And the way I've articulated this before is that there seems to be this sort of belief within certain areas of the Church of England that unity is a sort of separate and maybe even higher concern than truth and faithfulness to God. And the saying that the heart of the gospel of re- is reconciliation is true in the sense that we are reconciled to God because we repent of our sin and are forgiven by him and reconciled to him and that we're reconciled to one another on the basis of a similar a similar um, decision to repent and to forgive one another, a sort of analogous decision, uh, 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 if you like, an embodiment of the gospel, a manifestation of the gospel mm. within the community of the church. But it's not a kind of bland reconciliation, which is just about inhabiting the same ecclesiological structure, even though we have fundamentally different ideas about what what constitutes faithfulness. Mm. And I think it's, it's as if they're these two naughty parties that just need to get their heads together uh, and there's some glorious ank and fudge that will do this uh, and, that, and then everything will be all right because it's somehow the act of reconciliation uh, rather than the proclamation of truth, which is the highest good. You know, it's the, it's the, it's this yeah. kind of virtue signaling, isn't it? It's a demonstrative um, thing. And it's, I, you know, yes, you, you, you could do, you could do, that in certain political contexts and it clearly has been worked to some success in some places in the world but that's not the same as within doctrine uh and i think if you look at the early church history you know it took us four ecumenical councils to get really fully behind the nicene creed in the end and 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 all that that meant it took us centuries of um uh, acrimony and faithfulness, yeah, uh, yeah and yeah, heresy, yes, but and heresy. But um, you know, it took the reason it took two centuries or so was because we didn't go around. Oh, well, what we need to do is just patch it up and yeah. uh, you, and you, negotiate you, bits of doctrine off. Well, if you if you don't believe in this bit, then we won't believe in that bit, and. Everybody will think, oh, what lovely people these are. And yeah, well, unity is the fruit of faithfulness, isn't it? It's not something mm. that can just exist in, as a kind of free floating abstract concept, regardless of what people actually think about God and how to honor mm. him. I mean, could you, if, for example, you had a wing of the Church of England that decided to start worshiping Satan, could we have unity with those people? You know, could we just say, well, well the gospel <laughs> is about you, reconciliation, isn't it? Uh, Beyond Belief, Radio 4 had an episode which oh i just goodness. i listened to i listened to um at one point i had to stop before i crashed the car Don't but about me. but about wicker wicker and um you know, paganism etc cetera, etc cetera. 
and they had a vicar on there who's the Church of England's representative to the pagan Wicca community. Uh, and it was all this sort of stuff, you know, well, we're, we're trying to see it from your point of view so that, you know, we, we, we want to, um, you know, have good friendly relations with with you, blah, de, blah, de, blah, blah. Um, uh, oh, you believe in a, you know, all powerful goddess. Well, that's, that's fine with us. I can see where you're coming from, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and um, well, Christianity doesn't work like that. Yes, it is about there is love and there is, re there is reconciliation. Um, but there's also, there's also fundamentally truth, isn't there? Yeah. That's just that's just moral <laughs> relativism, isn't it? And that's the same oh, exactly. thing that I think is going on here. It's just saying, well, it doesn't matter what we think about what's right or wrong. The important thing is that we're nice to each other. Um, yeah. Anyway, do you remember we, the movie? Do you remember the movie Kingdom of Heaven? Yeah, I think I uh, should. Two thousand and five. I, I, I only watched that's part sort of. of it. Yeah, I know it's very, it was very boring. After what I found that, that 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 was pretty much coming along those lines. You know that the whole Middle East thing it, it could really be resolved. Because it was resolved briefly, over a thousand years ago, um, but then some bad actors came in who were, of course, you know, Christians. European, um, English. I don't know, <laughs> uh, uh, and messed the whole thing up because they're just yeah. mean. Yeah. Having said that, I would really like to watch uh, Ridley Scott's new film, uh, Napoleon. I think it's called Napoleon. Uh, with um, Joaquin Phoenix as Napoleon, but that's uh, that the trailer makes it look really good. Anyway, um, Daniel, uh, we should do our email of the week in a minute and uh, finish. Um, but just let me give a plug to say to people that um, we really appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you could support us, uh, we would really appreciate that as well. You can support us simply by sharing this episode and subscribing to us and reviewing us on iTunes as well. But you can also support us um, by becoming a subscriber on Patreon. Uh, which we really, really appreciate. We need money to run this show. Uh, I rely very heavily on the income from this show. So it really makes a real world difference to me if you subscribe or not. And also we need the money for running costs as well. So please do consider uh, subscribing to us on Patreon by going to irreverendpod.com and clicking on the big red button. That's irreverendpod.com. Clicking on the big red button and uh, becoming a Patreon today, which you can do for as little as £1.50 per month plus VAT in the UK. It's very, very little amount of money. And in return, you get the episodes as soon as we've made them and you get our bonus episodes, which are called their audio podcast called Uncollared, where sometimes we sometimes we talk about serious stuff, sometimes less serious, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's not. A number of people said the last episode was hilarious with, with Tom Pelham. Um, and of course, you get access to the entire back catalogue of them as well. Uh, and it's just, you know, off the record stuff um behind the paywall so you know sometimes we're a little bit more open about stuff we wouldn't put out there on the airwaves so it's kind of like an uncensored uh, version um but you get that if you support us um just as a thank you and we really enjoy making that um so please do consider supporting us by going to irreverendpod.com and clicking on the big red button and subscribing for one pound 50 plus vat uh, in the uk per month or more if you have more uh, which we really, really appreciate. So please do do that or buy us a coffee, which is just um, making a, a donation online and you can leave a um, you can leave a message on there uh, like uh, like the ones we read out earlier. But if you like the podcast and you want to support us, then please do do that because it makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, so now, email of the week. So last last week we were talking about this uh, this crazy situation. And again, it kind of it kind of plays into this sort of all this geopolitical unrest that we've been talking about uh, in the Canadian Parliament where um, the entire Can Canadian Parliament stood up and gave a round of applause to uh, a man who was a 98-year-old former member of the SS. Uh, you can't make it up, can you? <laughs> you, can, you can't. And <laughs> one of the things that I said is that I wonder whether there was anyone there who actually realised that he was a Nazi or whether literally everyone, all the hundreds of people in that parliament, uh, were just so sort of blissfully naive about it. Anyway, so I can't name this person, um, but he trust me, he knows what he's talking about. Uh, good day, gentlemen. In your latest podcast, you raised the question of whether somebody in Canada's parliament knew to whom they were giving three standing ovations. I didn't realize it was three. Well, the woman standing behind Trudeau and Zelensky cheering the loudest. I didn't actually realize Zelensky was there. Zelensky was there as well. Mm, no. Cheer cheering the loudest is none other than the Ukrainian daughter of the editor 
of Hitler's propaganda newspaper in Poland before and during the war. Her name is Christia Freeland, our current Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance and Rabid Russophobe. She knew who Yaroslav Honka was and would have met him several times through her work in the Council of Ukrainian Canadians. Her uncle, through this council, for years gave lectures at the University of Alberta, glorifying the merits of the SS Galicia Division, which was the division that Hunko was in. Don't get me wrong about Trudeau. That would require 20 emails to express how I and most Canadians view his tenure. And then he he gives um, an article uh, below, which goes into a lot, a lot of detail about. So this is the this is just to, let me get it right. This is the deputy prime minister, Christia Freeland, whose grandfather worked for a Nazi newspaper that recruited for the Galicia division of the Waffen FS, which was the division that Yaroslav Honka, who was the Nazi, was recently honoured by Can- Canada's parliament, was actually in. So, um, so there you go. And I'll, I'll put I'll put the article. I read I've read through the article, and um, it does seem uh, just really interesting to see this. And um, there's just one part of it I wanted to to read out, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, yeah, this is it here. Uh, Rather, so in this regard, it's difficult to regard Freeland's revision, revisionist family history as an isolated incident. That's referring to the way she's tried to sort of whitewash the past. Rather, as I've argued since I began writing on this topic a few years ago, it's part of a broader trend in the Ukrainian diasporic establishment of rehabilitating the image of Nazi sympathizers as anti communist freedom fighters, which is why monuments to the 14th Waffen, which is an SS. Um, division exist in Oakville, Ontario, Edmonton, Alberta, as well as in Detroit and Philadelphia. It's also why in 2019, a $30,000 endowment fund for the University of Alberta's Canadian Institute for Ukrainian Studies was established in Hunker's name without controversy until now. Uh, It shouldn't be surprising that the CIUS, which is that organization I just mentioned, would accept an endowment in the name of an SS fighter, CUIS, CIUS co-founder Peter Saverin, who served as the University of Alberta's chancellor uh, from 82 to 86, was himself a 14th Waffen um, veteran. And it just it just goes on like this. But I mean, it's uh, it's pretty incredible, really. And it really sort of highlights the the the. You know the the implausibility. I think that this is this is a sort of because comp- I think Daniel, in my sort of naivety, what I think about this kind of thing is well, it must be an accident. There can't be any sort of sympathy for 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 like somebody who was in the SS and was a Ukrainian Nazi. There can't possibly can be can there. But you know, I've got to say, like when you look at the evidence, you just think, well, there obviously must be to some degree. Otherwise, mm-hmm. otherwise she would not be standing up and applauding him. I don't know what you think. Strange times. <laughs> yeah, it's it's odd, isn't it? Because it, it goes back to what we we're talking mm-hmm. about earlier, and you know, maybe we shouldn't get into the whole thing again. But we're talking about the way the left has essentially become kind of Nazified. They've kind of become like fascists, you know. So they support things that in the past have been associated with the far right. Now they're the ones who are kind of seemingly associated with them, and it's a really, I don't know, it's just really disturbing. And, and, and if you think that you know, in in the kind of fifties and sixties and that israel was a project of the left yeah you know bourgeois families would send their children to kibbutz in israel to have a summer camp experience of living in some sort of socialist utopia well that times have changed they are changing and i'm not saying i i understand this or anything i'm just i all i'm doing is just observing it you know Mm. you know you see this kind of the manifestation of Nazi sim- Nazi sympathy in, in Western nations, and you you know you kind of I, I'm amazed I'm amazed by it, but I, you can't you can't deny it. What's happened, you know, it's presented as just a kind of a, a sort of freak mishap. But I you you know one wonders if we are you know if this is like a way of you know, as the article implies, sort of sort of softly in introducing a kind of a kind of sympathy for this this sort of sentiment for for some reason you know for some you know clearly pernicious reason i mean who knows uh, one, one thing i should say just as we finish the episode is i'm sure that there'll be people who feel strongly about things that have been said in this episode and that's absolutely fine you know as we've said you know we're all we're trying to do is just make the best out of things you know from from our perspective and with the knowledge that we have 
uh, I'm sure you'd agree with me, Daniel, that uh, we're we're open to learning more about what's going on and to hearing different perspectives and everything like that. Um, and we, you know, we we do we do genuinely try and sort of listen to people and and take people's perspectives on board. I asked on our Telegram group, for example, what people thought about various things this week, just so I could get a feel for where people are coming from. Mm. So if, if anyone has uh, feedback or questions or anything they'd like to share, we do read all, all the emails that are sent into the show. So just send us an email, irreverendpod at gmail.com. That's irreverendpod at gmail.com. And we'll at least look at it. Um, but we, you know, we I read everything and you know, mm-hmm. take take it on board. So uh, please do do that. Inevitably, you know, like you know, with the Russia Ukraine thing, I felt the same way. Like inevitably, we're going to disappoint some people through not being strong enough in some areas or being too weak in others or whatever it might be. Um, that's the way it is, folks. You know, we can't please everyone. There are thousands of people who listen to this show, so do bear with but, us. But, you know, in the end, though we do talk about current affairs, we are. Uh... A faith-based podcast we are inviting people to that inner battle to conversion to christ to seeing things through the christian lens exactly we, we're we're vicars aren't we i'm not dressed we're like vicars we're three, you are. three yeah. vicars you know we're vicars yeah. and well, tom's most are. tom's mostly orthodox you know and, uh, and we're 100 percent orthodox so. yeah I, I should get him a t-shirt for christmas <laughs> mostly mostly, mostly. Mostly orthodox. And I was no. think I was thinking like a really good new merchandise design would be just the just irrev with a with a little full stop at the end of it. I think that would be a really good design, like irrev. and then like a little you know full stop, like just irrev. Go for and, it. Then, and then people would look at it and they would just know what it means. Mm. They would people would say, well, "What's that short for? Is that short for irreverent? What's that? Mm. What kind of t shirt is that?" And they say, "No, come on." This is the reverence, you know, it's the irreverence, you know, it's, you know what it is, you know who they are. Anyway, Daniel, have you got um, something that you can finish? Yeah, this finish is the uh, collect prayer for next Sunday, which is a prayer asking that the Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Oh God, for as so much as without you, we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct, and so rule our hearts. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and he reigns with you, all in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks as ever, Daniel, for your insights and for your company. And um, thanks to everyone for listening. And until next time, keep watch. Keep the faith. Excellent.